This conference will now be recorded. I'd like to call the order the February 22nd, 2021 work session on sidewalks to order at 6.05 p.m. Meeting called to order. Are there any additions or corrections to the agenda tonight? If not, would anyone like to make a motion to accept the agenda? <clears throat> Councilor Webb. I'll move to accept the agenda as written. Is there a second? I'll second that motion to uh, accept the uh, agenda. Thank you, Councilor Williams. Would you call the roll, please, Stephanie? Mayor Hilbert? Aye. Councilor Webb? Aye. Councilor Allen? Aye. Councilor Williams? Aye. Motion carried. Thank you, Stephanie. We'll move right into the subject of sidewalks tonight. Staff has a presentation for us. I'm not sure who, who wants to talk, if it's Josette or Robert. Um, I can get started. I haven't necessarily put any formal thing together, but just some summary of the research and general understanding of how the fee in lieu of structure works for such improvements. Um, I know that we're talking about a fee in lieu of structure being put into place with Louisiana Avenue as a kind of general as a general um, example for how it can be implemented. City of St. Helens has this kind of structure in place and we've done it multiple times where the applicant can choose to go forward with the fee in lieu of instead of actually constructing the public improvements, uh, the public improvements being a sidewalk, curb and gutter, and the road itself. And then um, financial, the financial amount that would be uh, paid for by the app for actually constructing those improvements would be given to the city to do that on a later date uh, through public improvements that could all be coalesced if taking the Louisiana Avenue example would be maybe Andy Purdue and several other applicants working at the same time they decide that they don't want to actually do the improvements and they go through with the in lieu of. And then the city of Vernonia would have the financial uh, backing to do that themselves. There are lots of different, um, there are lots of different details that can be decided upon and whether that's, um, whether the finances are dictated by how the engineers are putting the plans together, whether there's a standard for how all of those are done that's put together by the city themselves. Um, I, I think all those details are things to necessarily figure out how Vernoni wants to set that up. I don't know if there are any particular questions on how this system works. Councilor Webb. Get my mic turned back on. So how do they determine the uh, the frontage uh, for the fee? You know, how, how, how do they determine that? Is it on frontage? Uh, we had questions about corner lots. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how is that dealt with? So different jurisdictions work with that differently. Um, you have corner lots that have obviously more frontage than just other lots that are facing one roadway. Um, certain ones say that it's just the actual major roadway that it abuts in the front of what the house would be. Others say that corner lots are also, also have frontage on both ends or both faces. St. Helens even has alleyways included in the frontage if alleyways are going to be improved. So some of them would have three 
faces to be improved upon. Um, for me, a possible solution to that might be that the actual tax lot is broken in half, and then the on either end, the major roadways are provided for by half of the tax lot, and then the minor roadways are provided for by each of the lots themselves that face that roadway. Okay, you lost me on that one, Robert. Could you say it a little slower? I'm a little slow tonight. Sure. Maybe if I can pull up a screen share, I don't know, Stephanie, if this is um, capable of me just sharing it right now, but I can zoom into. So at the bottom of the screen, there's the buttons for the mic camera. And if you hit screen, you'll be able to share your screen. Just make sure you pick the one you want to, everyone to see. The entire thing. <laughs> not not all the other ones I don't want to share with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, here we go. Screen share. Do you see it? Presenter. Yeah, I'm. It says that I need to ask the organizer to make me the presenter. Okay. You're out there. There you go. You should be good. All right. Everybody can see this now? Not yet. Hasn't come up on our There you go. Can you see the mouse as well? I'm not seeing my mouse on the shirt. I see it. OK, great. So. Um, this is the county web maps. If you're familiar with it, you have Louisiana Avenue running down here. And so what I was describing was having half of the tax lot, say this is Andy Perdue's tax lot, half of it that is on the eastern side closest to Louisiana Avenue, include that in its in lieu of and then all three of these would also pay for this minor roadway. And then three of these would pay for this minor roadway and half of this major roadway. So you mean half the block would pay for that roadway, right? <coughs> um, so those are each individual. Yeah, half, of, half the block on the west side and then half the block on the east side. Okay. And so that also, that's part of determining if you want to go with a standardized fee or if you just decide that every applicant, if you just decide that every applicant um, has to make their own designing and come up with a cost estimate to propose to the city. And then if that gets accepted, then either they construct it or they pay the estimated cost that they came up with. Robert, is that how the city of St. Helens uh, does it on a new development like that? The uh, city of St. Helens has the applicant come up with all the design, the applicant come up with the cost estimate, and then 125% is paid to the city. Of course, um, they <coughs> should by the end of the day. <coughs> yes, Mr. Allen, Councillor Allen. Yeah, Robert, that seems a little odd that the applicant would design it and then present a cost and then say, well, I'm not going to build it, but here's the cost I say it's going to cost. And then who verifies that cost if there's an argument? Because uh, say it's a retaining wall and, you know, it's in a difficult location. Mm -hmm. uh, that'd be up to public works if it gets accepted or not, or up to city engineer, that'd be us reviewing the actual design and estimate proposed. Okay, 
Yeah, that seems like that could create a lot of back and forth. Yeah, it absolutely could. <clears throat> Councillor Webb. Councillor Webb. Well, it looks under that example, then the corner lots are the more expensive lots because they've got two frontages in. The way that I was trying to describe the example that I was giving, it'd actually be that the entire block takes on the cost of the major roadways. Say Louisiana Avenue is the major roadway. So the entire block takes on that cost together instead of having the corner lots take on more of a cost because they're at the corner and because they have that extra frontage. But what if you had individual lot owners through there, then the corner lot bears the burden, I assume. I, I don't quite follow having the... Well, see, see those ones you showed us that were all, you know, I don't know how many was there, six up a side. Yeah, there's six on the they, north, six on the south. Say those were all in owned individually, or say there's two different ownerships, each of them had three. Mm -hmm. Would you assign the people on the top part of that street still the cost for the Louisiana frontage, even though they, you see what I'm saying? You got two different owners there. <clears throat> Um, I was suggesting that here, if I can share it again, I suppose you could do that. Yeah. So theoretically each, so this being a block having six on the North, six on the South, each block is surrounded by two major roadways, Louisiana over here and uh, i don't quite remember what the one to the west is california california thank you so if half of this block the three northern and the three southern paid for the improvements on louisiana avenue and then the three western or sorry the six western paid for california they'd be paying for each other's major roadways on either side. And then you'd have the six Northern paying for uh, H Street up here and the six Southern paying for G Street down here. Oh, I see. So they share part of the alley cost and they brunt the burden of the Main Street cost. I think we should stay away from the alley because the alley is actually this extra little middle spot. Oh, okay. It could, also, could also be a requirement to improve, but um, I'm just trying to use Louisiana Avenue as a major, Louisiana and California as major roadways and then H and G as minor roadways in this example. Uh, it makes sense now. This is just, you know, my suggestion on how to make it maybe more dispersed, more fair for the entire block owner, and it's not. Which, uh, Josette? Robert, do any of the ones that you researched require a fee in lieu, but then use it in a different area? Because <clears throat> yes. one of the ideas that the council is looking at is maybe someone needs to pay for a sidewalk because it's in the code, but then if their street isn't a real connectivity place, maybe putting those funds somewhere else, does any other jurisdiction do that? Yeah, it, um, I'm not necessarily in the loop with how it actually works, but it, it's stated that it goes into the general public works funding for street improvements with the understanding that the street that it's being paid in lieu of will get done, but it doesn't necessarily have to happen with those distinct uh, finances from the applicant. So like you're saying, maybe Andy pays in right now, that gets used for some other street, with the understanding that Louisiana will also be developed 
when the time comes. Okay. Councilor Allen. Yeah, Robert, how many cities do you, are you working with? Um, as the engineer or as the consultant? Yeah, either one. I mean, just kind of getting an idea how much you're, how many small towns you're involved with. Uh, so we're only city engineers with Vernonia. Uh, Lower Columbia Engineering does consulting um, with most of what's in the Northeast of Oregon. So I'd say seven other townships. Okay, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Uh, I was just, I'm curious that, um, is there anyone that makes them put the sidewalks in and then the fee for the curb street and other things and then when the road is ready to be built, see the money is is kind of in is already there. I think that's a little difficult of a distinction because all of those parts get thrown in as frontage improvements. So frontage improvements include the street, the curb, and the sidewalks themselves. And so to have the applicant build the sidewalks and curb without the roadway. Um, I would suppose it's possible. I haven't heard of that because, like I'm saying, it's all thrown in together as the front as the frontage improvements. Um, but it could be theoretically possible. Right. I get what you're saying. Thank you. Well, I got a question for Josette. Go ahead, Councilor Allen. So, Josette, let's just say hypothetically we collected a bunch of fees up there uh, where we were on our tour the other day. Maybe we collected from 10, 12, 20 houses, and then we got a grant. And then the grant paid for Louisiana. And then is that going to be a situation where the homeowners say, wait a minute, I paid for street improvements and then I found out you got a grant and that went through. So just wonder how that would work. I don't think so because if they are choosing not to put the sidewalk in themselves and they're paying a fee in lieu, we would have it set up so that it gives, like Robert said, it gives us the right to use that funding to do connectivity within the city. Um, so I think they kind of forego their right for it to be their street if they're not willing to do it at the time of construction. Okay, because the way I understood Robert was, and correct me if I'm wrong, Robert, that the fee would be based on the total construction of the frontage on the block which is gravel, excavation, street building, pavement, curb, sidewalk, divide that up by everybody in that block, and that's your fee. That's one example, yeah. Yeah, that's how, I think that's how St. Helens does it. What you guys were talking about tonight is whether or not to continue the waiver or, or take away the waiver and say, you either build the sidewalk or you pay this that's relative to your frontage that we put in a kitty to do connectivity sidewalks in the city. Ultimately, yours may be part of that project down the line, but we're not promising it today. So they either build their right. sidewalk or pay a fee. Do we have any idea what that fee would be? That the city is actually putting that in right then and there. Say that again, Robert. I was just saying, like you're saying, that just because they're paying the fee in lieu of at that time doesn't mean that the city's coming in right after that and putting it in. Councilor Allen. Do we have any ballpark estimates on what people are paying? I mean, is it 5000 10000 I know that my boss who put together the plans for our office 
paid about twenty five thousand for the frontage. I don't have a good way of relating that more into a residential lot. Um, that's again part of the decision if it becomes a standardized fee that you're paying X amount per linear foot of frontage or if you're paying based off of the applicant's cost estimate. Um, if the applicants are deciding how to are actually coming up with the plans and then again coming up with the estimate it's all that's all part of the decision to be made i'm looking on their website to see if i can find if they have a basic city of st helens mm -hmm. no because city of st helens has the applicant uh turn in a cost of it all the, the applicant has Good, Stephanie. Well, Go I, ahead, got Stephanie. Couple, I got a couple responses from cities uh, one of them was north plains and their fee in lieu includes uh, a lot of improvements so there's 13 items it includes sidewalk base rock driveway apron uh like improvements to a um sorry what's the word it's the planter strip um curb and gutter concrete paving finish rock base rock street signs water system storm system sanitary sewer and a franchise allowance and their fee in lieu is 648 dollars per linear foot and then that's, I think, high end uh, because that includes all of that. And then I also got a response from North Bend, which is smaller, smaller fun city. Um, theirs is really old, it hasn't been updated in a long time, but uh, they're doing infill lots also. Sorry. They're looking at doing a $150 to $170 per linear foot frontage fee and a non remonstrance agreement. Sorry, you broke up there. So they're, they're discussing theirs right now, an update to it, and they're talking about doing $150 to $170 linear foot frontage fee. And they're also having them sign a waiver of remonstrance. So they're doing a double whammy. Which means you put it in. It doesn't make sense, really, does it? I mean, explain that one to me. That's just what they told me. Grant. I just ran the calculator on that. If you had a 50 foot wide lot, that would be $32,000. And seven hundred dollars, thirty-two seven. I ran so it that. It looks like they're probably trying to get people to put it all in themselves because the fee in lieu is not attractive. <laughs> right? Yeah. But that includes well, you, a lot. Well, and I wonder how they get around the driveway apron. You would almost have to put that in as a city, right? I don't know. I think they probably do the improvements. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if that really helps or not, but that's the info I got. Go ahead, Grant. Uh, well, uh, when we're trying to calculate it, we've already got the sewer and the uh, all that all that infrastructure already in, right? Well, typically, like on Andy's, he's putting in the water and sewer lines and doing upgrades to our water lines. 
as part of the development. So the developer is doing that part. Yeah, okay. So that, that part's not necessarily part of the frontage improvements. No. Right. Go ahead, Grant. It's, it sounds to me like what North Plains is doing is not exactly the same situation as what we have at hand. They're, they're talking about taking just a plain field with nothing and, and developing it all the way, you know, from zero to uh, ready for the house to hook up to it, which is completely different than what we're facing. Go ahead, JR. You had your hand up first. Well, Grant, I see your point. In some cases, yes, but in a lot of cases, it's going to be no. There's a huge area in that boot once it becomes city limits, if that day comes where there's nothing there. Um, but maybe one sewer main running. So there's a lot of areas in our city. There's areas in our city where there is no roads, no alleys. Um, so And nothing else either. Right. Keep in mind the area Andy is developing, there was nothing there. He's putting in all of that. So if he, in the North Plains scenario, if he didn't want to do that, he'd pay the city to put in that main and put in that base rock and put in the water and sewer and the hydrants and all that. So it, it is kind of apples to apples on that way. It more than likely once that area is developed, it'd be, so it almost needs to be consider both both scenarios because there's going to be areas like second avenue where there is a, a road and there is a water main and a sewer main but they don't have sidewalks so those would be the improvements that they would be paying for so it's kind of taking like how the north plans has it and only doing a subset because we could continue to require the developers or whoever's building one house to put in the water and sewer main to their location you could just not make that an option. That makes sense. Good, Grant. That doesn't sound very practical if you've got uh, different builders, uh, different owners. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't see how that would work. I mean, how, how does one guy hook up the sewer? I mean, you've got to hook into a main. They install a new main. Okay, we've but had, we've had that done in I think four different locations now in the last year, two years, like maybe three years. Are you talking about uh, making making those uh, like the pipes bigger? I mean, it it doesn't make no. any sense to no, me. No, I'm talking about where they don't exist. It's just a patch of dirt or a patch of trees. They remove all of that. And then they put in the, the road, they put in the, a new water main, a new sewer main, hydrants, road base, they put in, it's from nothing. We have had, that. I don't know if it's really on topic, but we have had that happen. And they pay for the engineering, they pay for actually our engineer to make sure that their engineer is correct. And then they also pay for all the construction of it. So that kind of improvement tends to be an extension. You have the main, whether it's sewer or water, coming up to a certain point, and then say their development is past that point, and they just need to actually extend that further so that they can tap lateral into it. Go ahead, Grant. Well, uh, I, I'm thinking of the situation right there where we're talking about where it's three or four blocks deep. Uh, how far up the hill does that sewer go? Only so to the where there's no main, now. Only, no, the right, main only, goes all the way up to Mellinger. No, I mean the arterial now, going up off of Louisiana, how far up that hill is is there water and sewer and and all the other things there isn't nothing, so the right? cross street mr purdue had to put in 
So he up to the, the block all west. the way to the furthest lot. And he brought it all the way back and hooked it to Louisiana. And if he goes the other way, he'll have to go all the way to the furthest lot. Okay, well, that, that's my so question. He does the, okay. Because it just didn't seem to me like it had been, uh, the, it didn't seem to me like there was a roadway, you know, the basic roadway cleared all the way up to the top yet. Maybe I just didn't see it. Well, so for those houses that he's putting in on G and H, the sewer is actually coming down the alley. So he's laid that entire sewer, hooked into our sewer main, down the alley in between the lots. You saw that there? You saw like a piece of equipment there that day yeah. in the yeah. middle? That's right. where the sewer is coming. Okay. Yeah. And then all those homes will come out the back of their properties and hook to it. That's easier than tearing up the street. <laughs> Culture Allen. So maybe Joe Sack can answer this. Has this been kind of a I know they horse trade in all sorts of cities and you do this, we'll give you a building permit and all that. But uh, is this been like an agreement? If you get the infrastructure in, we're not going to do it as a city right now. You want to do it, go ahead. So you can build houses or, I mean, is there been an agreement where we're not going to make you do this if you do that? No. So um, Mr. Purdue bought that block of 12 lots. Right. And <clears throat> we just hold his feet to the public work standards that says, if you're going to build houses here, you have to meet all these public work standards criteria. So there's no agreement other than what the, exists in the code. He just has to pre present what exists in the code to build there. So okay, he had to do you. that on I Street as well. He took the water and sewer all the way even where the houses that we went down I Street and we looked at all that kind of lots that dropped down, those people will connect to mis what Mr. Purdue put in the middle of I Street. Because we made him put big enough in the middle of I Street that it could take the eight homes that could potentially connect to it. Because that's the public work standard. See, I know there isn't really a way to get a deal. We just require you to meet the code. Right. Is there an estimated cost on the work he's done? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> I don't, I, we didn't get an estimated cost on it. No, we, we haven't gotten an estimated cost either. That's not really a requirement for us to see that as far as I know. So one of the other things you guys had requested us to get information on, and Robert got us back some estimates, um, we talked about doing some sort of surveying and just marking all of the right-of-ways as they come off Louisiana. Um, and there are a few spots where there's no development, so it may, the price may go up a little depending on how difficult it is. Um, but just getting those kind of monuments for the right of ways would be between five and eight thousand dollars. And then if we wanted to do a more detailed um, project, the beginning number where we establish elevations at the intersections um, for future builders to meet whatever elevation we're going to try and make Louisiana so that all the stormwater works and everything, um, the beginning estimate for that is. 10 to 15,000. So in our discussions on your priority list, you have the north-south connection of Louisiana as a, prior, as a project, um, which potentially, we, if you went and did the elevation data one for 10 to 15, potentially we would add on kind of getting that right-of-way outlined in its boundaries 
to ultimately make that north-south connection, there'd be trees and different things removed to actually get it drivable, but we could get it marked appropriately as part of that, but either one of those projects. And just, it may add us a little bit more money, but that's one of the things that Public Works been, committee has been trying to get done is that north-south connection platted and prepared so we could ultimately someday have it go through. Jill, said I have a question. Yes. Um, on that top street, is it I Street or H Street off of Louisiana that the four uh, homes in there that we walked down the other yes. day? Uh, Are those homeowners required to put a sidewalk in now? Um, in, or is that just the way it's going to be? How How is that street going to end up when it's finished? So I believe... I believe they all have waivers of remonstrance. Okay. So they've agreed if if the council decides, hey, if the lower lots get built out, say, so then there's eight homes on that section of I Street and the council came and said, we're gonna form an improvement district. The people that signed waivers could not vote no. And so you could form an improvement district that says you're, we're going to get sidewalks in here and you either pay up front, put it on the back of your mortgage, but they can't say no to that type of endeavor once they've signed a waiver. So that's the leverage the council really has is a future date saying, okay, if we're going to pave Louisiana, maybe those, those side streets or offshoots of Louisiana need to become improvement districts pay into it and then at one time each road is getting fixed or upgraded to the standard of the sidewalk and everything. So, so far everyone that's built off Louisiana has had to sign a waiver of remonstrance. In the old days there were some people that got away without signing one and I don't know how many of you know Helen Hudson. She used to live down at the bottom house on uh, Louisiana and she was always in City Hall when I was mayor really barking about that everyone that builds there should have to sign a waiver because she didn't want it to be that the city never had the leverage to make it the improvement. So she was kind of a champion of that waiver being signed by everyone from the get-go. So we've kept up on that. I think all but two up there were before our time of making people sign them. So the way I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, is everybody on that street, both sides, each individual landowner would get a vote. And if there was a bunch of empty lots, them, them owners could say no, and you can't put the district in there. So you have to wait till there's enough houses that have remonstrances signed. I think the threshold, if I'm right, is 66% of yes votes even could make the no votes have to go with it. So right now on I Street, we have 50-50, right? You have the four houses that have signed them. The four empty lots below could say no. But if one more of those houses comes in, I think you ultimately will get to the percentage that it would be a given. But like on G&H, all of his houses have them. So you're about 50-50 with those as well, right? Because you have, on G Street, you have the six houses that face G, you have the lower six, and on H, you have the six houses that face H, and you have the upper H. So you're about 50% right now on the side street homes on Louisiana. And, and who signed those waivers? Was it the developer that owned the lots at the time before he sold the house, or was it the people that bought the house? So it's currently the owners, whoever owns the land when the waiver is drafted, and the waiver follows the property after that. It doesn't matter who owns it. It sticks with the property forever. Yeah, I'm just curious. So if, I, if, a builder, pick up if, if a builder signs one, kicks it down the road, I buy the house, I'm still stuck with 
what the property has marked on it. So that's kind of the idea that I was saying to you guys about developers are kind of kicking the can down the road to the homeowner who may not read their title report, although every homeowner should read the title report, and then be kind of unbeknownst to them have this requirement when the city comes back and says, do it. So that was one pro for just ripping off the Band-Aid and make everyone put in their damn sidewalk. Right. But there's cons to that too if it's a sidewalk to nowhere. But the city has to be ready and have the resources to back up that requirement. Which requirement? If you said all of a sudden we have to do it, you're going to have surveyors down there putting in monuments, you're going to have engineering fees and stuff. You have to do your part. So I think partly yes, but really the onerous would be on whoever's building it to prove to our engineer that it's what it should be. Right, I understand. Where it should be. Oh, okay. I understand that. As, like the elevation and stuff, yes, we would need to be ready and have those things we want them to need it to set up, yes. I was curious. I would be curious, Josette, what other um, towns would do as far as what what their requirements are. Is it just a couple monuments for surveyed in and that's it? and they have to go from there or how much engineering is really required, you know. Um, I, I don't know if you've had a chance to look into that, but I'd be curious. Robert looks like he might have something. So the, the idea of doing the surveying and the engineering beforehand, before even requiring them to put together the construction and the plans, really has to do with making a uniform connection through all the sidewalks and the roadways. You could just as well say each individual um, owner who's gonna put in the improvements has to come up with the plans themselves. The downside of that is you then might have just wonky connections that don't necessarily meet up the way that you want them to. Um, the pro of surveying is that you have the pro of the surveying and planning beforehand is that everything should meet up as planned, and that's already established. And then the uh, individuals putting together the specific plans know what they have to meet. So the public work standard does have the cross section and all the height requirements and everything for what they have to install. What's really missing up there is right-of-way survey monuments and elevation that we want them to hit. That's the missing component there because we could hand them the public work standards and they could install it easily to the drawings that are required, but it's the elevations and the monument markers that are missing. So if that's something council's interested in getting going for Louisiana and those cross streets as this becomes kind of a mecca for people that are trying to get out of the high price of Metro, then we should work to put that in the budget and and plan for that come July 1, we start that project or something. Well, I think it's key to start that. I mean, if you're gonna have any kind of standard or something that looks decent up there, you're going to have to have, like you say, the monuments and some elevations and some sort of engineering plan. So. Because I think the way it's plotted right now, you could easily <laughs> drop drop the, the road standard and the sidewalk standard on the plat as it's plotted right now pretty easily. It's getting that same design and standard on the in the ground, right? Go ahead, Dale. Well, kind of more back towards the sidewalk into this. Um, I think once we understand what our end goal is, we can understand maybe how we get there. 
I haven't heard yet, uh, at least a consensus. I don't know if we've even looked at doing that, but, you know, there's, there's probably like three or four options that we have, you know, that's the rip the bandaid off and everybody just has to put in sidewalks and curbs and, um, I mean, that's one option. Uh, you know, maybe an option is if it looks like a development, it is a development. Uh, but, you know, there again, the legalities of that might be tricky. That's what they're playing against us right now. Uh, you know, there's there's the idea of we don't need sidewalks and curbs on every street. What we're looking for is sidewalks that connect our town throughout so we collect the fees to uh start building that infrastructure only and then there's always the last option of doing nothing um i don't think probably any of us are too fond of that one but uh, so once we kind of understand what our goal is then maybe we can understand you know what you know some of these fees we're seeing i mean it's like man i was like uh I'm not developing my lot, <laughs> not at 640 foot, uh, $40 a foot. Uh, anyhow, and even the lower number there was is pretty high. But and we, we, we've heard numbers before. I mean, I heard JR just doing off the top of his head calculations, cost concrete width and length. And, you know, we're talking three, four thousand bucks uh, to put a sidewalk down one frontage um i kind of like the idea of that robert brought up though is in these developments every parcel is paying in a share on that common frontage that i think helps solve some of that issue of a big parcel some big parcel owner uh he's actually going to get some cost share from uh, other areas um because people are going to walk his frontage. They're going to use his frontage that ends up getting, if we put it in there. So I think really to get anywhere, we're going to have to kind of decide what that end goal looks like. And then we can kind of start calculating, uh, you know, what kind of monies we're going to need to accomplish that goal. Councilor Allen. So you Dale makes some good points and you know, government's not real efficient and they're not real cost effective. And we all know that things are more expensive when you let somebody else do them. So if the fee is set to the point, it doesn't matter what it is, there'll be a contractor somewhere that says, Hey, I can do that cheaper. I already got the equipment here. I'm going to put this in, not pay that fee. And you're going to end up with a lot of sidewalk done and then the fee is always an option but i think the fee becomes the deterrent or the or the incentive to do it because if you just collect a bunch of fees up in one big area and the money goes in the old parts of town i'm going to be kind of pissed off if i live in that new area and all the fees and i never see anything done it takes 30 years or something so that part scares me a little bit about spending money in other places that people had never paid but um so uh, um, I'm not against putting a fee on it. I think something needs to be done. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of leaning toward we need to solve this. But I think if the fee is sub a little bit substantial, you'll see people putting in sidewalks and, and other improvements or paying a partial fee for the curb and gutter, you know, and say, we're going to do the sidewalk. And when you guys do the street later, here's that part or something. But um, I think it's going to take some some work from our staff to get some real numbers, you know, on on all those improvements that except, you know, besides just the sidewalk. But um, I think the sidewalks are important, especially we're heading toward the schools and everywhere in our town. The kids are walking out in the streets and whatnot. So. Um, I know it's a burden when you start when you start adding twenty five or thirty thousand dollars to a lot. Uh, it's going to kill the growth here in town. That's just be honest. So, 
I don't think that's going to work. Um, you're going to pay that much more and come up and, and welcome to West Oregon Electric and drive in 100 miles a day. People might change their mind real quick. I know I would. So, but uh, that's just my thought. Go ahead, Josette. So one uh, option that Dale kind of hit on um, that is really a missing component is these unimproved platted areas. <clears throat> you could solve some of this. He hit on it because he said, well, if it looks like a subdivision or a development, but the code really lacks any direction for staff or even for planning on these unimproved platted areas. They don't match a subdivision. They're not just a single family residence being built. So it might be interesting to see what other towns, if other towns were platted like us, what did, what did code did they apply or what did they put in their code to address these areas? Because if you think about it, every one of those blocks has 12, 24, 48, we're going to get to like 90 to 100 homes up there that we have no code, that we're just going off single family, the code for single family residences right now. So that might be something staff could look into what other towns have done and maybe there's something that fits in it. You could put it in for those kind of developments like Andy's doing where it does require a little bit more than a single family residence because in for all intents and purposes, it's a subdivision. It's just not been subdivided. As subdivision, we would make them put in the road, asphalted. That's the requirement for a subdivision, but he's basically putting in a subdivision and that requirement doesn't fall to him because it's not in the book. What do you guys think of us looking into that? I wouldn't be against looking into that. There's got to be a solution somewhere. So I think it's a good idea to look into that because you can't just build a little bit here and there all over the place and call it not a subdivision when pretty soon half your lots are taken up. And then he's like, well, I'm done. Bye. You know, he's right. not trying to screw us, obviously, but, uh, it, you know, <laughs> If that keeps going on forever, pretty soon there's problems and we're stuck holding the ball or the homeowners are for drainage and streets and, you know, you know, the problems right. that come even up on the Halem and stuff. Right. Councilor Webb had his hand up first. So, and, and that's easier when you've got one person owning, you know, that big block of plot, but it's not as easy when you got separate landowners. Well, I'm just building one home. Uh, I guess I guess you draw the line is that is a platted area. It falls. It, it looks and smells and drinks like a subdivision. It's going to be eventually a subdivision. And I guess maybe we just pull that Band-Aid off, like Josette said. I'm trying to think of. The 180 from it is somebody in an area that it isn't platted that way. Then they get treated differently. Is that what I'm being, or or so maybe that we do the fee and lieu in that in instance, maybe. Yeah. So you have the low hanging fruit. So that's an empty lot in an already built out area. Then you have like the places in the boot. Those are going to be subdivisions. If anybody puts anything in, they're going to have, there's no road existing there. They're going to have to plot a road and dedicate it to the public and all that. So you could also allow for a single lot. If someone owns a single lot, they fall under single family residence. But you could say if one person is building two or more homes, you follow this code. And maybe it's shy of a full subdivision code but it's more than a single family residence. That's what I'm thinking has to exist out there is something that isn't a full blown subdivision with fire hydrants, asphalt, all of it. And it isn't just one guy building his own house. It's somewhere in the middle. And I think the code could 
waiver one way or the other depending on what it what you're trying to cover because in that pro in that area dale there's like you'll have one one family owns three lots the other one owns the other nine so it's going to be more than two and it's not just going to be one so there's a they're broken up in weird ways where they're multiple lots. There's very few lots, sections of that Louisiana area that it's like five different owners down the street. It's just not currently. A good example of that, of that, Joe, that is what became, what came before us at the last council meeting to that property owner that wants to build a house on second Avenue that has those large lots there. Yeah. Right. At the end of second. That's a perfect example I just talked described. Stephanie. So in that scenario, if it was an owner who's just building one house, but they own more than one lot, would you have them sign an agreement saying I will not apply for another building permit for this property in two years, three years? how would because there's properties like perfect example is fabian's they own a whole block but they built one house four years ago i think five years ago a while ago it's newer and then now they're building one right next to it and they're going to be selling their old house but they're going to keep all the property behind them so in that scenario would they be treated exactly like the other developers or would anybody who's building on a tax lot but owns adjoining lot have to sign an agreement saying no permits will be issued for this property adjacent property for x amount of time how would that work yeah i think i don't know that's why i'm wondering if some other town has done this because there's got to be an example out there and the pitfalls because I think, honestly, um, I think there, I have a hard time believing that Fabian's not going to subdivide her property and disconnect the other ones since Andy brought the sewer down or the water up G Street, that they're not going to parcel their property and take advantage of that connected to their old house. There's four lots there. I think they'll take advantage of that. So I think, yeah, you'd have to have something. What, Joseph, if you're, what's the, if you're gonna, yeah, go ahead. What's the recourse on a developer that pays for that infrastructure and then says, no, I put that in, you're gonna pay me back for hooking into it. So Andy had the opportunity on I Street to file for a reimbursement district with the city. He also had that opportunity to do it on G&H and he didn't do it. But Is ahead he of, of him doing that, he could have submitted a letter to you guys and said, I would like this area to be a reimbursement district so when other people hook up to it, he gets paid back. He gives us a list of his costs that were incurred to do that. And then we divide it by the remaining lots that he doesn't own and write up an agreement. And then the city would charge those people when they come in here and pay Andy. Similar to how we did it out at, on the water line that goes out to the old farm out there. They were required, they formed a reimbursement district and it was like going to be like $11,000 for someone to hook up to city water out there because they would have to pay them that fee and reimbursement. So those things are on the book and he could have done that. He just didn't. Is there a timeline? He has to do it before the house houses are closed and under different ownership, the entire section. So on G Street, whatever's going into those homes, he would have to file for a reimbursement district before he sells and tr property transfers in name on H or G from him to a new owner. Because once there's one new owner, he can't do it. And I've told him multiple times that's available to him. Um, I don't know why. But once it's connected to us and there's different owners than the developer, then it becomes city infrastructure and he can't request that reimbursement any further. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Robert. Josette, I have a question with that. 
is that applicable to what he did in Louisiana Avenue too, or is it just what he has going through the alleyway for the H and G Street development? He could do it for so um, if he's if it's new, he can do it. So H and G. If it's bigger than what we have, if he upsizes in order to meet the capacity of something across the street, he could also do it. If it's the same that exists there, like in the main, if he's just doing the same, just changing the material, it wouldn't really qualify as an, an additional capacity. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I don't know why it's a simple letter to the council asking them in a list of costs. I, I would do it in a heartbeat, but. Go ahead, Councilor Webb. No, well, it sounds like we still have to solve that large parcel single ownership issue. Uh, I know before I think they had like a certain so many build trigger, something like that, but then they just always stop short of it, you know. I mean, it's, um, and we would still require the waiver remonstrance on on those and. Yeah, I'm just trying to wrap my head. Ahead. What's what's the mechanism there to pull the trigger on those? I mean, it's sounding like we're talking anything that's pre-platted. We're we're going to rip the bandaid off and basically require the the full build out. Now it sounds sounds like that's what I'm hearing. And uh, but still, we got to have some equity in how we treat the other people. Um. Yeah, <laughs> it's a tough one. That's always the stumbling block. But you know, those single builders with a big parcel, and they take advantage of us. And it's basically the same thing that's going on here. But I think I think with this pre-platted, it's pretty clear what's going on. Those are subdivisions. It isn't individuals. And even if it was individuals, once they all build out it's a subdivision so right and i think there's got to be a trigger point there too yeah how do we deal with that it's one thing when one guy owns the whole block he's developing the whole block but if those were all different individuals we don't want to pull the trigger and have them put everything in while we're still in there doing all this construction work I mean, because you know, so the destruction of. Is, yeah. So another alternative, just to add to the confusion, is the city could always figure out where's the next place it's going to be going in and do their own reimbursement district. Put our sewer and water down the drag with with the stub out, bring it to grade, put in the layers of rock, get it all dialed in. And then those owners, you know, would have to pay back as they develop. So that's also an option. I don't know if anyone's got a crystal ball on which next block they're going to develop, but. Well, I, I think that forces the issue kind of because if we put in a nice, you know, street in there that the development bug on those people join. I think that's kind of what holds some places back from developing. I mean, Andy's really the, been the pioneer of, uh, I mean, I Street, is that the first street we've had built in Vernonia and how long? You know, full right. half street a improvement. While. I mean, other than, I mean, for the street part. So, yeah, but it's kind of a gamble. We tie up the city resources funds. It might take a lot of years to get it all back. Um, right. We knew this wasn't going to be easy, folks. <laughs> Can we move ahead tonight? And I'm 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 listening to two different scenarios. Can we move ahead tonight with maybe a general consensus to have staff move forward? to look into the uh, the cost of the 
setting the monuments and elevations off of Louisiana um, in preparation for developing those lower uh, streets um, and get a, get those. What did you say, Josette? I, I heard about 600 and some dollars for each. Um, so, so, so the to get the monuments and do the serving of the right of ways for the letter streets, how they connect and mark into Louisiana. Yeah. That's about five to eight thousand um, dollars. And then, if we wanted to go further and do the elevation, that starts at between ten and fifteen, depending on how difficult some of it would be um, for the plan. So, if you guys, um, if you're interested and have consensus, then we can work to put that money into the budget so that we're, it's, you know, ready to go July one that we could start doing movement towards that. I'm good with that, personally. Yeah, yeah. me too. The reason I brought it up is because it's a good starting point and to move on. And then um, I guess we deal with the sidewalks. Uh, we're, we're kicking the can down the road, seems like, but at least we have, you know, um, we've already issued some waivers in that in the trailer court with those 12 properties, haven't we? Oh, so, yeah. So maybe we could also direct staff to get us some more information about uh, Luffy in Luffy's and, and um, uh, you know, for another workshop on this. Um, also, so that's just my recommendation for the council. Stephanie. So are you wanting to see what a fee and lieu from for the city of Vernonia could look like? Do you want, because it would take engineering fees. So do you want to pay the city engineer to see what that fee would actually be here? I'm not sure, I don't know what, what else you guys want in that regard. Well, there's a couple of different scenarios about a little infill is different than a whole build out. So I don't know, are they gonna give us two different prices? Like I was saying earlier, there are the different options for what the fee in lieu of actually ends up being. If it ends up being that the individuals come up with the designs and estimates themselves. If we have a standardized detail that City of Vernonia accepts, and uh, if applicants go with the fee in lieu of, that's the standard that gets implemented. It could also be a standard that the applicants have to install regardless of using a fee in lieu of. So we can we can come up with multiple price options dependent on multiple fee in lieu of situations. Councilor Webb. Yeah, and I, and I think another point to consider is, again, goes back to our goals. I mean, we could end up with basically the subdivisions being built up there, out up there, and all have nice sidewalks and then there's sidewalks to nowhere. Uh, how are we going to fund the interconnectivity portion of it? If we're not we're not gathering anything there, um, or or does or does a better look? You know, maybe there again. Do every little side street need to have a sidewalk on it? Services. You know, say four houses up one side, and it needs a full blown sidewalk. Comes down Louisiana, we got a sidewalk there, and then it ends. Gonna end at say uh, Helen's old place, and then and then we've got nothing. How do we connect out from there? Um, or does the picture look better of, of collecting a fee in lieu 
and building that one big sidewalk all the way down Louisiana on one side and, and down Louisiana all the way down connect up to Bridge Street. Is is that the vision that we have or or you know that's what I struggle with. We can have a lot of concrete up there and that technically subdivisions, but it's nice to walk around the neighborhood and that's where it ends. Robert. Yep. So part of that possibility, like I think Josette mentioned, was having the upfront, the city put the upfront cost in and actually develop that. I know that that comes up with a little bit more difficult financing as opposed to the fee in lieu of where the applicants are paying forward and then the city will come back on the back end. But if you have the upfront of, say, Louisiana Avenue all developed, then the side streets are a little bit easier to manage because that major street is already put together. So one option is if you, if you prepare to do the north-south connection, and, and I was making sure my mic was on, and you put in the base rock, the lift, and the curbing, and don't put in sidewalks until houses are positioned, right? However they're positioned, because that's the worst thing to put in concrete and have someone cut right through it for a driveway apron. Um, but you could just get the, the stormwater in culvert right underneath, with catch basins on the corners. You could do that ahead as the city and then requiring those cross streets isn't a big deal because then you're just doing one sidewalk at some time via safe routes to schools grant or something like that. So you could piecemeal and do partial development of a good base, good three quarter inch minus, storm waters, culverts, catch basins, and then as blocks are developed, the city pays to put a curb in and they run their sidewalk to that curb. So there's all ways to do it. I think it's a long process because, I mean, I don't see every one of those blocks getting built out in the next five to seven years. Could be, but it seems a little unrealistic. Yeah. Yeah, and the thing that catches us, I think we've all kind of have the understanding getting this paid for up front uh, puts it on the mortgage. We don't like, I mean, and I think the improvement districts, I think you said does end up going on, it can go into the mortgage. Is that right, Josette? Yeah, I think if it's not an action of their doing, they the mortgage companies are required like a FEMA elevation. So, so I guess end. I guess then I guess then that does work for us. That just a scenario you just provided, basically building out Louisiana, letting them build the side streets. Once they're filled out, we pull the pin on the remonstrances. And, and do the LIDs, I guess, or, or, you know, or we require a developer to pay the fees up front and hold them to do them. So I, I don't know. <laughs> I just want, require them to do them. Yeah, so I think if we get the, the details and the data for what, it, what needs to be there elevation-wise, you could almost leave the three options. Do it yourself, pay us a fee, or we do an LID. Those, I mean, those are, they could still be potentials, right? And I think if those are your three options and you're building your own house, you're probably going to put the sidewalk into the elevation. If you're a developer, you may do, a, you know, fee in lieu because you don't want to trouble yourself with it until the rest of those lots get built out. There's no one saying you have to just have one of these options, really. Yeah. We should have some economy of scale, too. Uh, if we go be able to get 
a bunch of work all at once. It should help with the pricing. Right. Go ahead, Dale. Or JR. Yeah, if I got a notice in the mail it was two or three hundred dollars a foot, I'd be out there performing up uh, my sidewalk and getting it poured myself. So <laughs> Uh, I think I think a lot of the builders uh, are going to probably do the same thing because they know their clients are probably going to see that on their on their deed transfer that hey people are going to catch on pretty soon that they're you know as soon as a few more houses go in here the city's going to go whammo and and uh, and they're not going to be happy and so I think the fee has got to be high enough that it pushes the incentive for somebody to do it as they build in most cases. Um, otherwise you're going to collect the fee prices are going to go up and we're still back where we are as a city now, because nobody, you know, we just don't have much for infrastructure or sidewalks and streets, but um, so I'm kind of curious of what that fee will end up working out. So I guess that's some information that uh, is that, Matt Strait, or is that you, Robert, that put that together? Or? To put together a cost for what it would be to do those improvements? Is that what develop asking? Vernonia's fee and lieu. And, and things up here are a little more expensive. you got contractors in the valley that are busier in hell. They don't want to pack up their crap and move to Vernonia, so you got that fee to add on there. I found that all the time. I'm too busy. I don't want to drive up there. So if you want to pay me an extra 30%, I'll come up there. But, you know, there's always that factor, too. Anything else? Is that something that entire council wants Robert to work on? Or are we ahead of the game here? Go ahead, Dale. I think we need to clarify exactly what that all would include. I mean, again, what are we, yeah, because that'd be out the curbing and all, right? What's in front of us is sidewalks and curbs. sidewalk curb and gutter and gutter yeah and what about building of the street well so in a single family home on right. a street that's already graveled in there isn't a requirement that's what it, that falls under more of the addressing the platted already platted areas with some sort of street requirement because right now they just fall under single family homes where if there's a gravel, if you have 25 feet of gravel frontage, the only thing you need is a waiver. You can drive right off that gravel under your parcel and not have a streets requirement. Dale. It's almost like we need this laid out for us on a piece of paper here. So, you know, the subdivision we understand. Now we're talking about the, the platted properties. I think we've got a direction we're thinking of going there. And then then we've got the single homes and how what what requirements we're requiring there. There's where we kind of get caught was that single home with on a big parcel like the one Stephanie was talking about down there off of uh, Oregon Street, I believe. Uh, pretty logical that could subdivide someday. And how we deal with that? How do we how do we not make this draconian thing for them to have to fit because there basically be infrastructure to nowhere, or at least in the near future. But then if a circumvent us and do do a subdivision in there, then they, I mean, I guess at that time you have to pull the pin on them, but 
I don't know what the trigger is. So typically if someone builds a house in the middle of two lots, we require them to combine those tax lots. So it's really only when someone builds a house on one third of three parcels that you have the potential risk. So what I hear you saying, Dale, is you want to see like the code, a single family home and what the requirements are, a subdivision and what the requirements, like more where you guys can look at it on paper and then have us investigate what if Fee and Lou looks like for Vernonia, have Robert work that up, and then also look at what other communities have done with already platted unimproved areas. And then come back to a thing where you guys have had time to read through all of it, and then maybe you'll have be closer to the decision on sidewalk and what we do. Yeah, that sounds good, Josette. I think that gets us closer. Okay. That's just me. I don't, I'm not hearing anybody else, though. No, I, I, I think it's going to be a several workshops. This is this has been a hundred year problem. It's not going to get solved in one day. So uh, we got through the parking, though. If we can get through that, we can get through this. <laughs> that only took about 10 years. <laughs> 20. Well, I think we made progress tonight, and I think conceptually everybody's kind of these these parceled out lands are basically, I think we're ready to start saying, no, they're subdivisions and we're going to start treating them more that way. So um, that's a big step for us right there. Just whatever we do, let's not kill our growth 100%, you know. <laughs> uh, trying to keep that in mind, obviously, so. I know the fees are high other places, but uh, to keep us attractive, we can't be as high as other places. That's just my opinion, but we can't do it for free and we can't go backwards forever either. So trying to find that balance, I, that's what I'm hoping to get to. And, and I think staff is going to have to help us quite a bit to get through this. So with the help of Matt and Robert and other people in the profession. So probably take us a few months to get through this. Sounds like we have a general consensus to move forward. Okay, if there's nothing else, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, I'd like to thank uh, Stephanie, go ahead. Real quick, um, I'll bring you guys a staff report. I think the best option will be the second meeting in March to schedule a work session. Very good. Thank you, Stephanie. Also, thank you, Robert, for your input tonight and, and being a part of this meeting. And and so if there's nothing else, I'll adjourn this workshop at uh, let's uh, adjourn it at 7.30 p.m. Meeting adjourned tonight. Good night.